Welcome to this week's episode of Art Wisdom with Chris and Kat. This week we have a special guest, Adam Rosen. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Adam's a sales guru, can I say that? Sales expert. But I'm going to let Adam explain and let, let everybody know who he is. Yeah, thank you, Chris and Kat. I appreciate you both having me on. It's it's we've already even just from this pre conversation, it's it's already been a lot of fun. So I'm excited to uh, to be here with you. So thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Where does your story start as far as what you do right now? Yeah, so it all started back in 1991. You know, it was uh, that's right when I was born. And then I remember, I'll never forget my first memory when I was born. I'm totally kidding, guys. Totally joking. <laughs> not going. Not, I have an exceptionally <laughs> early memory from from having yeah. my nappy changed as a kid. How weird really? is that? Oh, yeah, really. That's, that's weird. But anyway, that's carry weird. on. Sorry. Yeah. That, We're unnecessary not there, Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. End of podcast. That was perfect. End of podcast. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Yes, I don't remember that early into my days, but yeah, at least for my entrepreneurial journey, because I, I, I've never had a true nine to five job coming out of college. I did a one year MBA program. I went to uh, university out in the Boston area in Boston, Massachusetts in the States. And uh, I did it. I started an entrepreneurial program my senior year of college. It went well. They offered me an opportunity to continue running that program, did a one year MBA. It went well. And uh Three weeks before I graduated, myself and my two original co-founders said, hey, let's dive all into this business idea and see where it goes. And we had it for about five years. It was a tech startup where we basically connected college student organizations, mainly at schools in the United States, to uh, companies for jobs and internships. So those were our, our clients, like Bank of America, Amazon, at and a lot of these larger companies in the States. And again, did that for about five years before we sold the company back in 2019. That's wow. amazing. Can I ask you a question? What was there like a defining moment where you realized that, that this, like the entrepreneurial route was the one that you were going to go down on? Yeah. I, see, like, I, I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur meant until I was probably a junior in college when I just happened to take an entrepreneurship class. Um, but for me, I, 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 since I was a little kid, I, I just always had big dreams and big ambitions. And uh, it was the entrepreneurial path. The more I learned about it, I just crave freedom. And I've always admired people not realizing that they were the entrepreneurs, but people that have achieved any type of greatness in their life. I don't care if it's in business. I don't care if it's in sports, if it's in art, if it's in teaching, if it's in anything. I'm always, I always admire people that have accomplished great success. And, and I found that entrepreneurship is a great way to do that. And that, that's what attracted it to, that's what attracted entrepreneurship to me. Um, but it really didn't start until I was probably, I don't know, 20, 21 years old in, in university. Oh, really? But like, was there like a moment was like a book you read or like you, you heard someone, you saw something that was like that sort of light bulb moment where you were like, oh, this is what I want to do. I wouldn't say there was like that light bulb moment, but the, when I, I became a, a someone who became fascinated in studying some of the most successful people in the world. And the commonality between every single one of them is that they were an entrepreneur, is that they were a builder, that they were a creator. So I wouldn't say there was that one moment, but it just became consistent where, hey, all these people I look up to and admire, they're entrepreneurs. They all took a dive. They all took a risk. They all put it all on the line and to build something, to build something of value. And uh, I'd say that was probably, I wouldn't say it was one moment, but it was these collective moments where it's like, all right, this is an alignment with my DNA and this is what I need to run towards. I love that. You're like the modern day Napoleon Hill in a way. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't give me that too, that much credit, but yes, I, lo I do love Napoleon that. Hill. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Now I'm going to tie all this back to how it works with art in a moment because you're a tech startup, but your sales is your background. Is that right? Like you're a tech startup and I suppose like any entrepreneur, you've got to sell what you're creating. Yeah. So was that, um, did that start another passion for you in sales? Yeah, it's a great point because that, that, that is the truth. I mean, I started a tech company, but I'm not a tech guy today. And I certainly was not when we started it. Um, and that can also add more challenges. But yeah, that was really my, my focus with my tech startup. Among other things, I was leading our sales. And sales, I found to be consistent across all industries. I don't care if you're a tech startup. I don't care if you're a service-based startup. I don't care if you're a small business selling cookies, selling artwork. It does not matter. Sales is consistent across and the fundamentals of sales is uh, consistent across as well. And 
since I sold the company back in 2019. And I always want to make it clear because my biggest, one of my biggest beasts with the small business startup world that probably everyone can relate to is I feel like it's over glamorized where we always want to share the good, but we don't share the truth and the reality and the hard truth sometimes about it. And the reason why I bring that up is because when I say I sold my company, you know, people assume that while I did actually move out to Hawaii, they assume I moved out to Hawaii when I did that, uh, you know, was uh, rich and retired at 26, 27, 28 years old, drinking Mai Tais on the beach every day. And that was not the case. That was not the type of exit that we had. It was more about getting our investors money back, um, uh, students in a good place, companies in a good place, and we can move on to the next journey. So anyway, I always like to make that fully clear. And uh, yeah, since then, though, I've done a lot of work advising and working with startups and small businesses. Many of these small businesses are companies that are doing similar work to maybe a lot of the folks that are listening or watching this podcast right now. And sales is, if you can learn the fundamentals of sales, it can be a massive X factor, especially if you're in a business where maybe there aren't so many people that are great at sales. Honestly, I feel like sales is everything like almost most like most interactions you ever have as a human being with another human being involves like uh, <laughs> this easter i was looking after my um my sister's kids for a couple of days and i tell you what negotiation skills is number one <laughs> for sure. what do you think and i mean i'm just going to dive right in but like what are the biggest mistakes you often see people make when it's they're coming to deal with their own sales? One is, is, uh, is first of all, this perception. And a lot of times we create this perception, especially in sales, that is not the reality. Like, and I feel bad for people that are in used car sales because I feel like they're always picked on. Um, but everyone knows the example, right? Like, oh, uh, that's a, like <laughs> honestly, it's like you go to a car yard and you feel like you need to shower when you leave because you feel gross. You know, like hard push, push, push. And it's well, like, ugh. And realization. It's like desperation. It stinks. Yeah. And, and, right. I, feel, and I feel bad because I don't know. I don't think that, you know, at least a lot of them deserve that. But there's those bad experiences we have, right? It's like the slick back hair, you know, pushy. People assume that's what sales is. It's like forcing you to do something that you don't really want to do. And sales mm. is the complete opposite of that. Um, so that's number one is like this negative perception. Uh, number two, though, especially in the small business side, but really all across the board, the number one mistake that sellers make is they talk too much. Mm. That should be my big problem, really. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's really interesting because the truth is, is that when you're talking, you're not listening. And actually the key mm. to sales is understanding where the person mm -hmm. is what they need and all of that stuff um so would you say it's really more important to be asking the questions and just sitting back and see how it plays out yeah in, in developing that connection and trust and and the reason why talking too much in, can be a big problem and i see a lot with entrepreneurs and and the reason why is because we're so passionate about what we do so we just want to share every little detail which is you know it's great in a way of course but the reason why it hurts us from a sales standpoint is I always say details create confusion, right? Mm. So if you talk too much, that's details. Details create confusion. And a confused buyer is never a buyer. So no, if you confuse 100%. someone, they'll never buy. So that's why it's so important to say what you speak with utility. And then to your point, ask a lot of great questions, Kat, you know, listen, show you genuinely are trying to solve a problem for them. And if you can't solve their problem, be honest with them. Um, and that's something that I, I think all small businesses, all salespeople, all startups, and myself can benefit from as a reminder as well. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. That really it comes in to like, if you're asking great questions, you're looking to solve their problem, then that negativity of sales and being the, you know, the, the horrible image that you have of a salesperson, if you're actually saying, well, actually, I can't solve your problem and you're willing to walk away from that, it takes away that stigma of trying to sell to everybody, maybe, and anybody who maybe don't even want it. So it gets rid of that pushiness. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And it removes the stress from you, it removes the pressure of feeling like you need to make that sale. And they can all feel that people can always feel desperation. I don't care if you're selling a product uh, or service. I don't care if you're trying to find, you know, a partner to date anybody, you know, when it comes to developing relationships, no matter what the relationship is, people can smell, they can feel desperation and no one wants to work with desperate energy. 
100 percent. you made me think of something actually when you said that people talk too much and there's like too much information it's confusing and it's like this concept of the brain you know you've got your obviously your reptilian your mammalian and your neocortex and like your reptilian is just your brain's such a cognitive miser it doesn't want to use energy and if you're being like pelted with information your brain's like it goes through like almost like a meltdown i mean if you've ever have you ever had like an email conversation where you really could have been just two lines and it's like paragraphs and you just go mm. later, <laughs> later might never come. And I feel like that's very true with like a lot of sales opportunities is that you get hit. It's like, it's like being chased versus chasing. And it's like, it feels like overwhelming. So I think before you, um, you know, before you deal with anything like that, you, you have to create some sort of level of rapport. And actually, I think approaching things with curiosity is like, for me, has been my, like my number one success, honestly. Yeah, being genuinely curious. I think that was probably from How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, that's probably from that that famous book from Dale Carnegie. Like, that's the same thing as just being genuinely interested in the other person. If you do that, your, your, your odds of connecting with them are, are going to skyrocket. I think we've talked about this a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with your website, with your social media, with everything, because the friction points, look at the friction mm-hmm. points for, for everything. So it's like the sales thing is the same thing again. I think yep, also it, exactly. like as to like the friction points, like having an offering that's overly complicated, not just like offering too much information, but it's like um we I I advised a friend on launching a print store actually. Now bear in mind this isn't a direct sales environment at all because it's obviously on a lot online or whatever. And you know, we said just do a really limited amount of things because people when they're overwhelmed with so much stuff, they, you know, it's, they're not going to be making any sort of like level of like impulse purchase because they've got to sit there and contemplate, do they want it in this size? There's so many different options. It, it gets really overwhelming. And I was like, you won't make the sales. And his, just the difference between offering, um, let's say 60 items versus eight items was the difference between making a 6% um, sales mm. rate versus what he did which was like 1.8 and I was like dude like you did great in your store but you could have done like three times better just by simplifying it and making it less overwhelming nice simplicity is one of my favorite words when it comes to sales startups anything it's just how do we make things easy when we have too many offerings people don't know what they want to buy we want to be recommended something hey here's what i recommend and here's the opportunity if that's not the right fit okay well here are some of my other offerings but you know to your point chris about the website how do we make things simple like when i'm when i'm working with people on their websites small business owners how many calls to action are there on your, on your website? And when I say call to action, I mean like what button can somebody press on? Is it to request a demo? Is it to buy a piece of your art? Is it a phone call? Is it to fill out a form to go on a waiting list, to join your newsletter? Like what's that call to action? And how many different call to actions do you have on your website? We need to make things simple. You know, I do talks around Gen Z and the future of work because of my previous tech startup that we had. And One of the things we talk about is how Gen Zers have the attention span of a goldfish, about eight seconds. But I hate to break it to all of us. You know, I'm not a Gen Zer, I'm a millennial. And all other generations, we all have a short attention span now. Because of the age of the internet, we all have such a short attention span where if we don't get to the point quickly, we're going to move on and go to something else. What's really interesting is watching someone consciously use either their phone or use a website is a bit creepy I have to look over someone's shoulder <laughs> but right much to that point if you ever watch someone so hypothetically on twitter how quickly someone scrolls they're scrolling at pace like mm. at speed you think you're going to write these big long intricate captions and have all this information they are past it in seconds you've not got the point across in millisecond it's over and the same really for watching people's websites and and any friction points man if it's taking going to take too long they're out if it's not loading properly they're out if it doesn't look like there's the right area they're out <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like so it's like but it's like often we don't get the opportunity to actually see that so i i know i feel like and of course, when people know they're being observed, they act differently. <laughs> so that's yeah, that's true. Yeah. Creeping. But 
I, th- I think that's where heat maps probably come in quite handy, but it, mm-hmm. it's not something that I see many people use in, in, yeah. in small art and small business as much as people in medium and larger businesses. And it's cheap to any one, actually. We should talk about heat maps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Adam, call to actions on your website. How many would you have? You know, because that can, I suppose, be too much as well. I, I like having just one simple call to action. Like one, I like to keep things so simple. Now it depends on the business. Well, my tech startup was a little bit different. We had two sided marketplace. It was a little more complex, but still less is less is better always. With my current business, there's literally one call to action on there. Fill out the form if you want to uh, potentially work with us. That's all that matters. You know, right. if you have any questions, you'll fill out the form. If you're interested, you'll fill out the form. There's nothing else that matters to us about you going on our website. Okay. Makes sense. Because really, it's just funneling people into your email list so that you can contact them more effect- effectively, right? Or book in calls. So you like have multiple buttons, but it all goes just to one place and it's just one path through. Yeah, exactly. And I do agree with the heat maps point because that was something fascinating for us with my tech start. We would look at how people use the website and you assume they'll use it a certain way. But then when you watch them in action, and it's crazy, like you literally just see what, how long they're on their website for, what, where their mouse is, what they're doing. And it is eye opening because we all have an ego where we assume people are going to spend more time, you know, going through our stuff and really diving into it and caring about it as much as we do. But the truth is they don't. And why should they? So that's why, again, making things simple, just have them take that next step. All that matters is getting, getting them to the next milestone. Hmm. Oh, all right. So we've got negativity with them, a salesperson, number one, talking too much and having desperation is number two. What else do we have for sales? Simplicity. <laughs> yeah, simplicity is simplicity is another big one. And, and this yeah. is in no specific order, by the way, but another one is authenticity. I remember when I first, when I was running my tech company, I started on the student side. And then my two co-founders at the time were like, hey, you should come on the sales side, Adam. I think you do well with it. One of my co-founders first was training me on sales. I knew nothing about sales. And when at first he was training me, he was teaching me the the way he learned it. And for anyone who knows Brian Tracy, he's like a very old school type of sales guy, very buttoned up and he's brilliant, really smart sales guy. And he's like, here's the 10 questions you always need to ask before you even share anything about your business. And the first sales calls I was on was like the most awkward things in the entire world. And I don't think I'm a very awkward person, but I've never <laughs> felt so awkward in my entire life. Like it was just painful. I'm like, well, I don't get, why do I need to ask this question before? I, like, well, I wouldn't want to answer all these questions either if I was in their shoes. So then I remember so I imagine my- Imagine you walking in like, hello, fellow kids. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> it was just awful. It was just so disingenuous. So anyway, then my other business partner who I still work with today, who, you know, is like a family member to me now, he's the best. And he's a little bit older than me, more experienced. He was like, Adam, just be yourself. And the only question that really matters is like, what are you looking for? How can I help? Like when you take an approach that's just genuine and like you share what you need to share, and then you just ask a simple question, what you'll see is people will share everything. Like I get on sales calls today where people give me way too much information. They tell me things they should never tell me. Why? Because it gives me all the leverage in the world, but they share it because they trust me and they know I'm not going to you know, use that against them, obviously. But when you develop trust, that's when that's when sales become fun. And the only way you can develop trust, though, is by being authentic to who you are. Don't sell like me. Don't sell like Kat or Chris or anybody else. Sell in a way that's authentic to you while mm-hmm. leveraging the sales fundamentals that have worked throughout time. Oh, I love that because it's just people just be yourself. And how mm-hmm. easy yeah. is that just to just to be yourself? Yeah, I think be yourself. Um unless you're very, very oversharing. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless you talk too much, then don't be yourself. Yeah, unless you're just weird. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's like be yourself, um, but do it with good intention, right? If, you go, if you're genuinely going in there to help someone, as in not even, it's not about lining your own pockets because again, that's, it's like the wrong thing. It's like, can you serve this person? And it will always work out good. Mm. Um why how do people get so there's a lot of people that the concept of like selling is terrifying you know like to us to even put themselves like how how do you recommend people deal with that side of things well first anyone who's like terrified of sales or i don't want to ask people for money or i don't know if Mm -hmm. my you know art for example is worth this much money or i don't know if i should be asking for money or any of that any of those insecurities that we all have every single one of us has them myself included 
I, I'm going to throw something out there that might sound a little contrarian, but I fully, fully, fully believe it. I, I teach classes uh, to small business owners every week virtually. And I had this exact conversation with somebody last week who's an amazing small business owner. She's in her 60s. She teaches health classes, um, has a fitness center, all this stuff. But she was just, she's scared to ask for money, but she's built this amazing community. So what I said to her was, by you not asking for money, and you're very, I can tell you're a very selfless person. You want to give, you want to, you care about other people. But by you not asking for money, it's actually the most selfish thing that you can do. And the reason why it's selfish is because if you are not asking for money, that means you're not generating revenue. If you're not generating revenue, you can't continue to grow your business. If you're not generating revenue and growing your business, eventually you're going to get so sick of doing all this stuff for free that you're not going to want to do this anymore. Then you're going to mm. probably stop doing this stuff mm. all because you were too scared to ask for money versus the more money you can ask for now, the more you can build your business, the more you're going to be able to add more value to more people for a longer period of time. So for me, it's always a psych psychological thing first is you're being selfish by not asking for money because you have something that's a value that people should be paying for, will want to pay for. And the more that they pay for it, the more you'll be able to create better art, more art mm. and help impact more people. So for me, that that's number one is the psychological side. Mm. I totally agree. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, when you're talking, I'm thinking of even like the reframing of it for art because people you know, is my art worth it? You know, is my art good enough? And all this kind of stuff. And then it's, well, not even that. It's the reframing it to you're being selfish, not sharing your art with people. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not the money side of it, it's like you have this talent, you have this ability. You know, people probably are telling you all the time that your art's great. And you're being selfish by not sharing that with people as well. The money side of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, the money side of it. That's, you know, it's just a reframe again, isn't it? Of that. I think in the money you side. You don't get the money. You can't keep doing what you love. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, when I got into it, I had, so, and I think a lot of people do, I had a dreadful money story. Like mm -hmm. my money story was probably the worst. You know, it was like, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. You know, who do you think you are asking for that? You know, all this stuff that get told as kids, that's just rubbish, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and I understand why it's said and all of that stuff, but how damaging that can be to hold on to and then have to actually operate as an adult in the actual world. So those things are useful as kids, but just recognizing that those things, you know, it's like time to reprogram. And I had to do a lot of work on that. And, and I recognize a lot of other artists had to do a, a great deal of art work on that. But also like this whole concept of value, right? And understanding your value as an artist. Now, the truth is, is that, of course, we could all live successfully without art. It very, you know, but would life be worth it? You know, because imagine a world without literature and films and Netflix imagine a world without patterns on clothes and everything's boring and bland and utilitarian there's no high cuisine there's no fashion there's just nothing it would be bloody awful so that's why art is really important because actually art is the bit that is the fun part of life well not the only fun part of life but one of the biggest fun parts of life yeah. so but I think that then comes down with understanding your purpose, your reason for being and like what you're putting out into the world um, and really understanding that, which I think sometimes doesn't come really quickly. But then I think that help allows you to actually understand and be able to, because when you're sharing artwork, it's not just like, you're not, in particular with like actual fine art, you're not just doing a wall decoration. If someone has a wall decoration, mm -hmm. they go down to Target or, you know, they'll go to Kmart or they'll go to Walmart and they'll buy something. Whereas we're trying to give them as something that's really thought provoking. That's like meaningful. And in some cases, an investment, I guess, as well as that aspect too. But yeah, I think understanding your purpose and what you can offer as a value is a good way. Because someone said something to me very early on, which is, you know, like almost always the price that you put down is a representation of your self-worth. And that for a lot of artists hit them hits them and it's like you gotta learn to value yourself as much as everything else yeah people don't tend to value what they either don't pay for or don't pay a lot for so mm. like even for me you know as I'm, I'm i'm buying a new pair of sneakers for example 
and I'm looking at different things. And when I see sneakers that are too inexpensive, I'm like, oh, you know, these probably aren't good quality. So I'm going to buy these. I'm not going to like them as yeah. much. And I'm just, I, I, even though they look good here, mm. prices, you know, less than what I was willing to pay for, but I'm like, I just, I don't think they're going to hold up. I don't, I don't think they're going to be good. So I'm going to, I'm looking for this price range. Even if it's a little more, I trust that they will be higher quality. And it's the same for anything. Like you, you, you can either be like the McDonald's or you can be, you know, the flame and yawn, or you can be somewhere in the middle, but know that where you price yourself is how people are going to view you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to be a Big Mac or do you want to be a filet mignon? It's going to be my major thing. Go tell everyone. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> It'll be my new quote. Yeah, what do you think about that, Chris? <sighs> Oh, we've talked about it before, haven't we? You know, like I'd be, if you put your prices so low, I'd be heartbroken if I seen mine out on the oh. road in the, the council tip because somebody paid $50 for it, which is, you and know. it I, didn't mean anything, yeah. It didn't mean anything to them because it's just disposable. So right. don't make yourself disposable. <laughs> Actually, that's a think, very good point. Sorry. Right. You got no, no, I, I think that's a really interesting point. And one of the things too is, let, let's say it takes you, I don't know, two hours to create a painting. Let's just use that as an example. And we're like, well, do I really feel comfortable selling a painting that I only worked two hours for, for, I don't know, $200. You're like, do I really feel comfortable paying that, charging that much? You're not charging for that two hours that you created that painting for. You charge for the decades, years, hours, like sweat, tears, everything you put into learning this craft to give you the ability to create this beautiful painting in just two hours. So that's mm. another thing too, is sometimes we say it only took me X amount of time to do this. So how can I charge that much money? It's no BS. You've learned and practiced and trained in this craft for so long. That's allowed you to create this beautiful piece of art in just two hours. So again, it's so much of sales, just psychological, and then just being yourself and presenting a, a solution to a potential problem. Yeah. I was thinking about this earlier very skilled artists are a bit like skilled actors in the sense that from the outside it looks really easy and occasionally right. you think ah oh, so easy and then you try it and you're like yes. you know you're, you're acting so wooden you're an insult to wood do you know what I mean <laughs> and <laughs> right yeah. I've never tried it and I feel like that's sort of also the thing with art that um sometimes it's artists you can not appreciate your level of skill because you do it all the time so you go oh it's nothing but then do you know what I mean everyone else is screaming I can't just check figure yeah. <laughs> it's like a typical response wow yeah so, me um, as the non-artist here I can say no it I, I was just in Florence Italy and I'm mind blown at the art <laughs> over there and anytime I see artists doing what you guys do it's like my hands I don't know how it's even possible like I literally don't know how, even know how it's possible to create the things that you guys create. So yeah, as the non-artist, I can say I, I when I see maybe when I see an actor, I'm like oh, I can act, and then I get behind a camera and I'm like I can't act. Oh, but hard. I never in a million years think that I could be an artist. <laughs> Not even a million years. You can put me in a paint night or those things where they teach you, yeah. and for some reason I still can't you know draw a moon. So I, I can't <laughs> do that. Chris actually did. You actually hosted one of those. <laughs> yeah, uh, paint nights. It's a lot of fun. It was we should all do one together, Adam. One. And it's amazing <laughs> that um, you know everyone just you can show them how to do it, then everyone will go off and has their own flavor on it. It was mm. fabulous because you know you're just saying we just would draw, say drawing the circle now. People would have their own, you know, like your signature is unique to you. I think where you yeah. paint to you as well oh it's very true both people very... and they were all completely different it was amazing so with um we were going to talk a bit about about um business to business emails i yep. love that <laughs> where do we start with emails adam I, I guess you should start at the beginning i guess which is getting the emails like having building an email list i guess do you want to start there yeah, so I'll give you uh, the high level for each of these things and we can dive as deep, we can get as nerdy as you want. I'm always happy to do that too. So uh, first of all, for anyone who's listening and they're like, well, you know, I'm an artist or, you know, maybe I sell it to uh, local shops or maybe I want to get into museums or wherever that might be, you know, know that you could leverage cold email to get you meetings with anyone that you want. And if you can learn how to leverage this as a skill, it can be a huge X factor because most people... Uh, just in general, don't know what they're doing. 
But especially when you look at these worlds that are not as used to sending out cold emails, like in the art world, it can be a huge X factor for you. So uh, for us, we, we, are, we have a team that's able to find email addresses for, uh, for folks. They typically use LinkedIn or Zoom info or those types of services to get it. Um, if you don't know how to find out that information, you can always uh, go on a website like upwork.com and find people that can build that list for you. And uh, they can help you to get email addresses. If you wanted, we could also help you to get email addresses, but there's plenty of other places to find that can help you do that. We have a really good team that does it for us when we work with our clients, but there's always resources to find email addresses. So rule number one to find them, just go on upwork.com and look for list builders and someone you can hire someone to find you contacts in a specific industry that you want to reach out to. That's number one before. Yep. So I, I, should I save my questions for the end? Cause it was funny. No, I was going to. Now I was going to pass each time we could just kind of pass okay. back to you guys to dive deeper. Because as fate would have it, <laughs> I pulled up a website just before this call um, because I want to contact a particular guy. <laughs> Happens to be a Japanese billionaire that loves space and has a big art collection. And I'm like, how do you get in front of someone that is so significant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously via email, I'm assuming, but like, where would you even start? Obviously looking for maybe their exec executive assistant or, I mean, when you're yep. trying to connect with someone in particular, is there a way? Yeah, like an individual person. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of these people, they, they probably either have a LinkedIn or maybe they have a company that they're associated with. So you can always play the guessing game. You know, if mm -hmm. there's one individual person, you could see their company, what company they're from, and then you can figure out what does that email address is typically look like at their company? You know, maybe it's first name dot last name at company name dot com. Uh, maybe it's you, you know, use a DNS checker <laughs> and just keep exactly, or you just send an email and if it bounces back wrong, try it again. So that that's one way of doing it. You Love can it. test um, if you don't want to just go the if you have one individual person and you know even just as a reference, like Mastercard became a client of ours. Because we emailed, my business partner emailed the CEO, Ajay Banga, who was gracious enough to spend multiple phone calls mentoring my business partner. And then they became a client because he passed this to the right people. And we, end, they, we ended up working with them. But that was, you know, a CEO of one of the biggest companies, you know, in the world, frankly. And that was all from a cold email. So you can, cold email can get you in touch with anybody. Oh, 100%. I, I've actually used something similar before um, to get in front of um Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX. Um, oh, wow. But yeah, so this is super cool. Yeah, so build your list. Now, like, is, do you usually go for like, this? because like, who goes on the list? Is it decision makers? Is it do you just email the CEOs? Are they not normally too busy? Or do you usually pick someone else? Like, how do you make that decision when you're building your list? Depends on the client we're working with. So we have one of our clients we do what we call as advice routes. So we reach out similar to how we got MasterCard as a client. That's what we do for her is she's in the, she sells into chief people officers, uh, human resource officers at companies, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion departments at companies. So we reach out to typically the chiefs at each of those positions to get her on phone calls for advice. So that's the route that we take a lot with her. Uh, then for other companies, they might want to go to, you know, so directors wait, or managers. When you say email for advice, do you literally just email people and say, hey, can I ask you a question? And that's how you start a, a nice conversation. Exactly. <gasps> yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> I'm, a, great. I'm a Steph, is it? <laughs> this is Love that. Can I just um even LinkedIn, because I've done it through LinkedIn, because you can get mm -hmm. a list of if you, you know, people are talking interior designers or anything mm -hmm. like that. You the guys are going like high level here. Let's <laughs> 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 which is great. It's great. But like yeah, but you could do all them. LinkedIn, you know, you can do that. Exactly. And you can go high, but we've also, re you know, reached out to entry level, typically not entry level, but above, mm -hmm. you know, entry level managers, directors above. So yeah, it's, it's, you can and reach out to any and all like mm -hmm. part of the thing with cold email outreach is it is a numbers game a bit. So, yeah. which can be a little bit more complicated, but if, if you just want to do it on a small scale, you can get super targeted if you want. Results won't be amazing. But yeah, if you can, if you can figure out how to create the systems, which I can, you know, at least share a little bit here, um, it can certainly help you. And it can get you in touch with, I promise you, anybody you want to get in touch with, if you know what to email right, which most people just don't know how to email properly. And that's why you don't get responses quite often. Most people don't get responses. But if you know how to do that, whether it's taking the advice route or a direct sales route, you can get on phone calls with the right folks. Yeah. 
I what love that. I... The email then. Sorry, say that again, Chris. You cut out for a second for me. What do we do next with the email? Yep. So first, you know, you got to get the list, right? Yep. Uh, second is we got to write the copy. So part of the copy is what is the problem that this person might be facing or what's the need that they have? What is your solution? What is your social proof? So like, you know, I've sold art to this person, this person, this person. My art is located here, here, and here. This press outlet wrote about me. This press outlet wrote about me. And this press outlet wrote about me. What's your social proof? Because people love social proof. And then what's your simple call to action? Do you have 15 minutes to chat on the phone? What is your simple call to action? But these emails should not be any more than five or six sentences. When I write an email, when we write an email, it's always one sentence per line. Mm. Very simple, very easy to read, no bulky paragraphs. So you got to write the copy, but then you got to follow up. So there's all softwares that can do all this stuff for you. Like we use a simple software. It's inexpensive. It's called GMAS. It helps right into your Gmail. Very easy. It does all these follow-ups automatically. You don't have to manually do it. Um, Cause obviously who the heck can even do that? Um, That's magic. Love that. And, and then the follow-up emails are just simple. Like for me, they're always like a simple one or two sentence. Hey, just making sure you saw this. Hey, are you interested in this? And the whole point is like, Hey, read my main email. If this is interesting, let's talk. If it's not interesting, you know, that's okay. Just let me know. I promise I won't, I won't keep bugging you, but just, you got to follow up. We found out from our clients on average, it takes four emails to get oh, one yeah. successful meeting set up. Mm -hmm. So if you're not following up, you're not even giving yourself a chance to get hmm. these meetings booked. Yeah. That's, that's actual gold. And um, because also I think the same for me, like whenever anyone's messaging me, I, it's not like I'm running a massive multi you know, pronged organization, you know, it's just me and six, a little team of six. So I'm too busy to read most emails. So I think keeping it really short and sweet, but then doing those follow-ups is because also, I think one of the things is it demonstrates that, um, you know, you actually care enough to respond. Like it's not just your, you know, you know, like, and I think that's super important, you know, it shows that you've, you actually care. One thing is though, like when you're doing follow-ups, it's like doing a follow-up without uh, being professionally courteous, without being annoying. So, mm -hmm. you know, might say, oh, hey, I'm just checking you got the last email, but then what do you say after then? Just keep on saying that on repeat or do you mix it up? So yeah, not the same exact thing each time, but some version <laughs> of that. Yeah. You know, anyway, you know, I had to just really a robot. cute photo of my dog. I thought you'd be interested. Anyway, did you yeah. see the last email? <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, I'm also not a big fan of like when people like we're. I'm emailing you for a point, obviously, and yeah, we want to keep things short and sweet and to the point. Like one of my biggest pet peeves, and this goes into follow ups too, mm. is can we stop, please? Like what? Well, especially on a first email, if we don't know each other. Like it's one thing if we know each other, and we're emailing. I'm emailing Chris or Kat, one of you, and I say, hey, I hope all is well. Like. You know, I hope your family is doing well, or I hope COVID doesn't hit you too hard, or I hope you're staying healthy or safe. Like it's different if I'm emailing one of you because we know each other. But mm -hmm. if I'm sending a cold email out blast, the amount of time in that valuable real estate, people are saying, you know, hi, I hope this email finds you well. And I hope you and your family are staying safe during COVID. It's like, yes, all that stuff sounds nice. But the reality is that is valuable real estate and you're wasting it with just wasted words that adds mm -hmm. zero value to it. Like if you really feel the need to put that, put that in like the last sentence right before, you know, you sign off your name, but stop wasting the valuable real estate and the follow-ups. Can we please stop antagonizing the people if they don't respond? It's not their fault that they didn't respond to you, but the amount of follow-ups I'll either get that I don't, that I haven't responded to, or that I'll see people send where they're like, Hey, well, clearly if you haven't responded to any of my emails, you don't care about X, Y, and Z. And then it's like, Ooh, what are you doing? Why, why are you, would you, you say you know? that? <laughs> that happens all the time happens all the time People it's like angry. why would you uh, it's like yeah you shame them not a way to win friends of course yeah. so adam exactly. what's a good opening statement then here's problem that i solve so you know hi hi chris i see you run a art focus podcast and i'm interested in being a guest you know period then boom here's like my social proof or here's why i might be a good guest for it do you have 15 minutes to chat so exactly what, what is, you want. No faffing around. It's like, this is what I do. This is what I could do for you. 
Right. Because you might say like, yes, I have an art podcast, but I don't take any guests. So I'm not interested. Or actually, I don't even do this podcast anymore. Or, you know what? Mm. I'm not, we're not going to record an episode for at least a month. But you know, right away, hopefully from the subject line too, of course, but from that first line, I know why this person's emailing me. And that's why it's so important to also know who I'm reaching out to. Like if I just reached out to everybody and I was like, hey, I heard you have a podcast, you know, and I'm potentially going to be, I want to be a guest and people got it. And they're like, I don't even have a podcast. Why are they reaching out? You know, so of course you have to be also targeted and know who you're reaching out to as well. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I often find that, um, at least if it's hyper-targeted, putting a tiny piece of pertinent information, um, that is relative or localized to that person. So, you know, I might say, oh, you know, I hope, hope things are going well in Idaho or like, you know, whatever it is, you know, not too much, but enough to know that it's like, because like ultimately everyone is looking for the same thing. Am I talking to a robot or is this a human being? And I think just something, a really small marker like that can really be helpful, um, but obviously not too much. <laughs> yeah, if you can get data stuff. like that. Yeah, if you can get some small piece of data, like the name of the podcast, for example, yep. like if you could put that, it makes it more personal. You know, mm. if I just said, if I said the name of your podcast versus if I just said, <laughs> I'm interested in being on a podcast, you would, you like the one that says the name of your podcast, of course. So if you can I'm have that stuff, it's- of course better like don't do it like hello insert name <laughs> you're like not right. tagged it properly <laughs> i would like exactly. to be on insert podcast <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's matter exactly that would be the worst way to introduce yourself <laughs> yeah and that's why and the thing i say too is like listen we all know like we're not confused we're not we know that these are typically mass outreaches mm. like for me it's like i'd rather just be straight like here's just let's just get to the point we all know it's a mass outreach for the most part, not always, it isn't always, but like, we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Just get to the point. The ones that try to pretend like they're not mass outreach by putting all this like fake BS, like things to try to create relevance. It's like, I know this is, I know you don't know a single thing about my business. I know you've never heard of me before and that's okay. If I have a problem that you might have a solution to, I'm interested, but like, don't pretend, make up, be disingenuous. That turns me off so much more. Yeah, mm, I, I love that because it's like, you know, um, small businesses, like you said before, small business is hard. You know, it, it can be a it can be a, a struggle, a journey. It's a growth journey. We take it because yep. we want to grow. You know, it's yep. Uh, yep. the biggest amount of growth that you'll ever have. Um, and I think just contacting people and then just getting to the point and going, you know, even if they think it's you're doing it to everybody, you've got to be a hustler, haven't you? So it's like you're a business person, you're an artist, but you're a business person. So be proud of your hustle. Mm. You know, even if they come back and went, you're sending this to everybody, damn straight, I'm sending it to everybody. Yeah, Yeah, and you'll miss out if you don't respond. Like you're not the (laughs) only person I'm reaching out to and my art is valuable. And that's Mm. a key piece of advice I got from one of my financial mentors when I, when I, really start to take my my life as a sole proprietor, which I still do on the side because I teach class and do some other things on the side, aside from my LLC, my email business. Mm-hmm. But I remember he said to me, it's like, Adam, I need you to not look at this as like, you know, the Adam, as like a sole proprietor, as a, as a contractor, mm-hmm. look at it like Adam Rosen Enterprise. And it's the same thing for anyone listening to this who ha- is an artist. You're not just an artist, that you're an enterprise, you're a business. Yeah. Like this is the umbrella, like your art is under the umbrella of your business, your enterprise. And we need to start treating ourselves as freelancers, not as a freelancer, but as an enterprise, as a business. And the more we do that, the more seriously we'll take it, the more systems we'll create, and the more we'll we'll take the sales craft also seriously. We're not just an artist. If you want to just be an artist, then you know work for a company that's looking for artists. But no, you're mm. a business person, you're an entrepreneur. And we need to start looking at ourselves like that if you have that gift of being an artist and you also want to be an entrepreneur. Mm. Now, you said before that you, sometimes you email people and ask them a question. That's how you got in with that big company. Is that something that a tactic that you will use or is that just a one off thing? Oh, no. Yeah. For one of the companies we work with, um, she goes the full advice route and that's how she gets all of her customers. And it's like the very similar. It's a better email because, we, you know, we sent it three, four years ago. And obviously we've learned a lot since then, but that's every single email that she gets on. And she gets on phone calls all the time. And they're like, this was the best email. I usually don't respond to stuff, but I responded to you. And these are like, you know, chiefs of very big companies that don't have much time that are getting on these phone calls and advice turns into sales. If you know, if you can connect with them on the phone. So yeah, I love that route. 
is it offering advice or trying to ask for advice no, ask, ask for advice yeah okay yeah so like what would be an example yeah like, so it'd be something like hey you know for her as an example it's i'm a, I'm a young founder i i'm a former i used to work at spotify now i created this business around helping gen zers create energizing habits i'd love to learn from you and your experience of working with gen z would you be open to a 15-minute call so i can learn more uh from you that type of email uh you know cleaned up a little bit better than what i just shared right there but yeah. something short sweet and to the point that yeah. basically just says hey here's who i am um you know, I'm not just like some nobody, like here's who I am, mm. but I also want to learn from you and your experience and your role. And it's relevant to them because that's what a lot of what their day is. And it's something that we know they're having conversations about internally is around engaging with Gen Z. So if you ask people in a, in a genuine way, they'll do it. We're, we're taking that route with another company we work with that's in the healthcare space. They sell a machine that kills viruses. And Right now, we're getting their CEO on calls with chief nursing officers or chief medical officers of these big hospitals and healthcare healthcare centers. So it could be a great route if you use it if you use it right. Yeah. That's fabulous. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how and, and for an artist and, and sorry, just to make it relevant, I don't mean to cut yeah. you off. For an artist, think about reaching out to any of your ideal buyers. Who's your ideal buyer? I don't know. Like name like who's like a dream dream buyers that that artist would want to get in touch with. Um. You've got for your me, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. The, I was it, uh, Yasuka Mazui. It's like that billionaire that's going to be flying loads of artists around the moon. <laughs> I was like, that's the guy I want to talk to. Perfect. So, people, people like that gentleman, or you know, who, whoever it is that you would love to speak to, like genuinely, whoever you'd love to speak to, and I'm sure there's many others in that space, but imagine yeah, sending out like an email, the head of NASA, let's say, just we'll just start small. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally anybody. And you could say, Hey, I'm a, I'm an artist. I've done art like X, Y, and Z. I'm really learning how to get more art in front of more hands, you know, like your, you know, whoever their company gets in front of, would you be open to a quick 15 minute call so I can learn more about how you would recommend I would do something like that. And I bet you'd get good responses from it because it's so genuine. I guarantee nobody's reaching out and doing that. Nobody is. Yeah. Everyone else is saying, how can I sell this to you? Got nothing to lose. Have you? No. And you, how do you, you get gain some if you know like people don't really have that big um history and you know of of shows and things like that mm. when they're you know putting things out to people so they don't have the back catalog to say i've done this this and this and this so they are maybe just starting yeah everybody starts somewhere and even that client i mentioned she never sold to a corporate client before she started working with us you know, her, her big thing was she worked at a great company, Spotify. She's a, you know, a younger founder and she found her social proof where she could. And we all have more social proof than we realize, mm -hmm. even if we have to, you know, try to figure, you know, find what that social proof is. We can find things that are interesting about us. And one of our clients, he's a former gold medalist. So we would put that there. You know, I'm a former gold medalist for the U S men's rowing team, like interesting things like that that we can find as just some way to create some commonality and make it feel more human. And everybody has, even if you haven't been doing this for the longest time, you don't have the most impressive stats to back you up. We all have more social proof than we probably realize. Yeah. And is it sort of more of a, a sticking power as well to go? So, you know, like he's, he's a gold medalist. It may not even be relevant to what you're selling, but it shows that he's got what it takes. So maybe it's not 1000%. even a of art. It might be like, you know, I've built a business that's, you know, whatever. 100%. Now I've decided to be an artist. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, exactly. That's 1000%. It's not about yeah. rowing or being an Olympic gold medalist being relevant to them. It's more about like, okay, this person has some type of character, some type of drive that helped them get to the highest level. You know, and it could be, I went, I took this big dive working for corporate, you know, a big corporate company. And now I'm becoming an artist full time because, you know, everybody wants to buy my paintings, whatever that hook is, yeah. that that's what you got to find. It doesn't have to be the most relevant thing to them. It just has to be some interesting hook that gives you some type of credibility. Yeah. Mm, I like that. And, and you can find it in all different places. You know, even if you're like brand new, I think sometimes just sharing, you know, even just sharing you know that you're a fledgling or you're you're but just sharing how passionate you are about it you know like mm. i think that goes quite a long way mm. and people want to help exactly people want mm. to help like that is a natural 
especially when you talk to, you know, maybe leaders, because every leader that's out there, and you two could be, I'm, I'm sure, a testament to this, is you all had people that, we all had people that helped us along the way. And oh, yeah. we, we love to mentor uh, people that have that good drive. And I, I look up to so many of my mentor, mentors that I have. And I, I, we all, we all want to have that. We all have that natural inclination to want to give back. So if you could tap into that emotional connection, people do tend to want to help. Yeah. When someone gets back to you after an advice email, where do you go from that? Do you just keep on asking until you build up enough rapport or, or is it just basically just sort of free flow, mm -hmm. however it goes? Uh, so you're saying after the advice, they, they already said yes to be on a call. Then you get on the phone call. You're saying, what do you, how do you, how do you convert that advice meeting to being yeah. an actual buyer? Yeah. I mean, and I'm assuming it might not happen in the first session, of course, like as, all, as with all things, but yeah, what would you do or how does that go? Yeah. And first of all, it, it very much can, if you do it right, doesn't mean it's always going to happen. Uh, but number one, again, then it just goes into the sales basics. Number one is trust being genuinely curious. So what are those like? few questions you really want to get to know from them and really insightful questions, not stock questions. These are like, you know, especially if you're talking to like these high up people, you want to make sure you're asking questions that are relevant. Don't and ask you want like, to force... what's the last three digits of your credit card? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Unless you could do it in a really smart way where they give it to you. I agree. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so yeah funny. exactly. Don't ask about that. They're social, <laughs> but also don't be like, you know, what was your career path to get there? Like that's no ask a very like straightforward question. That's relevant to your business. So like, Hey, here's background on myself. I just left this company. I'm an artist. I think my art is pretty darn good. I had someone pay $500 for a piece of art for me, but I'm, I want to get more into, you know, companies, whatever it is. Um, can you teach me if you were in my shoes, how would you start selling your art as someone that doesn't have a ton of experience? What would you do in my shoes? Boom. Then they'll start answering that question. Then you can ask another question based off of that. Another question based off of that, but all very like specific questions that are actually relevant to you. Cause you have stock BS questions to, especially these leaders, they're going to smell it. They're like, this is such a waste of my time. Like just watch them. One of the interviews that I have, and you can read one of these answers, listen to one of these answers. So make it relevant. And then at the end, you know, a, always a good question to ask if, if they're not like giving you buying questions is always like, Hey, I'm always looking for feedback and advice on how I can improve. So, you know, why would you not want to buy this art for me? Like, please tell me every reason you wouldn't purchase a piece of art for me. Tell me every reason you wouldn't put me into your, you know, studio. Tell me every reason why you wouldn't want to broadcast my art to everybody in your, you know, network or email list. Like, tell me why you wouldn't buy it for me. And always say that, be like, hey, I just want to get advice, feedback. I want to learn and grow. And I, I really want to hear your honest feedback. So why wouldn't you do this for me? Mm. It's always a really like nice, warm way of asking that question. And don't be offended. And just, just don't take it personally, whatever is said, like, because there's always mm -hmm. something that you can learn from in that situation, whatever, whatever comes out for sure. Because I think that's something some people would be generally worried about asking, like, can you give me feedback on my artwork for someone that they respect? Because, you know, I think a lot of artists, like their work is like an extension of them. And that's like <gasps> that feeling of rejection, sure. but realistically not really being rejected. It's just just not a fit and that's a-okay do you know what I mean everyone's got such pers like personal tastes as well and just going into it with that thought is really important as well yeah. just to um not ex like I, I feel like it's to expect too much in like not to say that it's never going to happen but I think if you have your heart set on and you get really upset that would be the worst situation <laughs> Mm. Oh, of course. Hey, we we got to put our ego to the side. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and on top of that too, you know, if, if it does get to the, the end of the call and it's wrapping up and they haven't bought yet, you know, they, they're not ready to buy from you. So how can you continue that conversation? So it doesn't just fade away. You can mm. do things like, Hey, is there, do you mind if I stay in touch as, you know, I continue to learn and grow? Would you mind if I stay in touch with you to keep you updated on my progress? Or, Hey, is there something you'd recommend I do, whether it's a book or an, an event I should attend or an organization I should attend? Like, is there something you recommend I do to get closer to accomplishing whatever it is that your goal is? Now, why is that such a great thing? Let's say they recommend a book for you. Once you read that book, you say, hey, can I follow up with you after the book is done? 
that gives you a reason to follow up and hopefully get on another phone call. And what they're going to want to see is, are you the real deal? Mm-hmm. Are you a person of your word? And the more you show that, the more trust that you gain, and they'll want to work with you because there's so few people that are people of their word that when they find that, they want to work with you. They want to find an excuse to do something together. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. I really like that. And, brave. and also it's brave, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's brave fantastic. questions. It is really brave. But yeah, I was I was laughing earlier because I went into um, an Uber and it, it had a list of how they wanted the ride. And the last one was ask the st- have a stereotypical conversation. And it was like, how long have you been working for Uber? Yeah. And I just yeah. laughed because it's like, that's the same questions. So like, mm. you know, I literally asked a stereotypical question right at the beginning when you got on, which was like, how did you get in? Where did it start? Although that is the whole point of explaining who you are on the po- podcast. Yeah. But in an email, cold email setting, you wouldn't necessarily do that, which I really like that you covered that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, with anything, when you develop real, real, when you would develop a real connection, you can only develop a real question by getting underneath the surface. And I think that's a big problem that a lot of us have, and I face it too, and even to this day sometimes. Like you stay in the surface level, and it's really hard to develop true relationships, business, personally, anything, if we don't get under the surface. So it's not that you're trying to, you know, figure out what their deepest fear is on the first call, but the the, the you know, that if we can get away from like the generic stock crap question, going back to what I shared earlier, when I first got into selling, asking these generic stock crap questions that are a waste of everybody's time. Yeah. But also don't be in there and say like, when was the last time you cried and what happened? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Don't get that deep yet either. Yeah. It's just coming to my mind to write a list of maybe the questions that you'd be terrified to ask somebody. And then they're the questions that you need to ask. I love that. And also, yeah, I think that would be it, wouldn't it? That would be like, yeah. I, also, I would say that there's nothing wrong with saying even before you ask them. Like, I'm actually kind of scared of saying this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> do you know what yeah. I mean? And I feel like setting the stage for being like, oh gosh, I feel yeah. like people have a great sense of sense of empathy when you're just being real, you know. But that's the other I, thing I, again, isn't it? Yeah, I. I just Chris and Kat, what you're saying with that, it's one of the big things too that I love on, on any meeting, you know, what sales meeting, you know, again, anything personal, you're going on your first date, whatever. The sooner you can let your guard down, the sooner they will let their guard down. Ooh. If we don't let our, if we don't let our guard down, they probably are not going to let their guard down. And if that doesn't happen, no, nothing is going to get accomplished. Yeah. The sooner I say, Hey, here's my goal. Here's my intent. The sooner they're going to say, okay, I get why they're here. I don't have to guess what their intent is. I know what their intent is. Then they'll let their guard down. But that's, it's like, you know, in negotiation, it's like whoever says the number first loses. So it's like, everyone's like, oh, I'm not going to tell you how much I buy this (laughs) sellers for. I'm not going to tell you how much I buy it for. And it's like this stalemate where I just, and then it's key. You can't, of course, do it in every situation, but the sooner you can let your guard down, the sooner you can get to authenticity. And that's when, again, trust and real relationships can be built, which is the heartbeat of every sales opportunity. I love mm. that because it, you just, you know, setting the intentions and your goals before you even kick off. Because sometimes I'm on a call with somebody and it's just going through my mind going, they, you know, they might be talking, talking. And I'm thinking, what do they want? What do they want? What are they <laughs> after? What are that? And that's going through my mind. Where's the catch? Well, yeah, you know, so if you have that up front, it's like actually my goal today is to, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think I'd relax if somebody did that to me and go, oh, okay, that's what's, yeah. Well, Chris, if you remember that our first conversation, that's, that's at least from what I remember, that's how it started was I said, hey, you know, for me, just so you know, here's why I reached out in the first place. And I just want to get to know better about, you know, your podcast and what you're looking to do. And yeah. if I'd be a fit for it, great. If I won't be a good fit for it, I won't be offended. No skin off my back, but I'm just happy that we had the opportunity to meet. So at least you knew right away. It's like, Hey, here's what his intentions are. And, you know, there's also the out where if you don't think I'm a good fit, then that that's okay too. Yeah. I just found in, in yeah. any opportunity sales or not sale, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. You know, the sooner you can be upfront about your intentions, the more we take our guard down and the more, again, a real relationship can be built. Yeah. I think also I was going to say that there's a lot to be said for just doing some research on the person that you're talking to before you get in there. So that, you know, because mm. that can be so like, you can create like a whole load, like you can, you can really throw away opportunities by just not doing the basics of like knowing 
who they are. You know, obviously, so you don't have to ask all of those basic questions, but you don't want to be like, so what do you do? <laughs> do you know what I mean? In a meeting with someone that you're trying to convince them to do something, yeah. you know, especially when it's like all over the internet, you should just do a few Google searches. Mm -hmm. A little bit of time spent there, I think is so valuable. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Wow. So we've got... Oh. So good, this. <laughs> I'm loving this. This is quite amazing, Adam, by the way, I might add. Like, oh, this has been a blast. I, yeah. I'm having a lot of fun with you guys. What are the what are the areas of email haven't we covered yet? I, I've got one, but it's I don't know if it's even rele relevant as such, which is like once you've been using an email list for a long time, which I have like a, a sizable list, like I need to like prune my list because it's been going for a few years mm -hmm. so that I'm not constantly hammering people that are never going to open. But like, how do you even work who that is? Because usually it's like, I know it's a percentage of something, but like, how do you identify even that? Yeah, it's a great question. So again, the software that we use that I highly recommend, it's so inexpensive each month. It's called GMAS. We use a lot of these different softwares. And the reason why I bring that up is because when we do these campaigns, Again, everything is tracked. So if they open it, we know that in the sheet. If they respond, we know that. And once they respond, they won't get another follow-up email from us. If the email bounced, we'll know that. Um, then we're able to go back to you know, our list team. And for things that bounce, we're able to try to find new contacts. If we haven't reached out to them in six months or a year, we can see who didn't respond to us, who opened and didn't reply, who never even opened the emails. Because um, that is the thing with lists, especially because people change jobs so frequently, we always have to be staying up to date for mm. people that are getting new jobs and they're leaving. And we'll, we see it all the time. We reach out and you know, there's in every batch of a thousand emails that we send, I don't know, there's probably at least 20 folks or so, probably more even that just got a new job. And this email is you know, no longer in use because this person left the company. So constantly building out lists, but also cleaning those lists is so important. And that's the stuff that we didn't know about but the stuff that frankly, people don't want to have to deal with. And, and that's, I'm very, very fortunate. We're very fortunate that we have good people on our team that do all that stuff for us. Cause it, it can be a big pain. Yeah. That's the stage I'm at at the moment. Cause I have a very sizable list and like, but it's been going for so long. So um, most people might not realize, but obviously even just unsubscribes can like hurt your deliverability. Mm -hmm. So like people get really upset because it's ended up in their spam folder or something instead of their main inbox. And it's like, because there's been a few unsubscribes and it's like, Oh, I need to learn how to prune. <laughs> well, if you, that tool, and again, I get nothing from sharing this. I don't get any money for it, but that GMAS yeah. tool does all that stuff. It'll check emails before it sends it to make sure that they're real. There's ways to, to monitor your spam, uh, see if you are going to people's spam inboxes. There's ways to warm up emails to make sure that you don't go to spam because all that stuff is so important. You don't want your domain to get, you know, blacklisted and sent into no. spam jail. Hmm. Sent to spam jail. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's amazing. Um, what else, what else, what, what is, what are the other things that people can do with regards to email? She's going to pick your brains to the last. I'm sorry. Happens. I'm like, I'm like, this is so amazing. I've got you here. I'm going to ask all the questions. So like, obviously we've got advice when it comes to direct. So, I mean, I would probably find I don't know, like the idea of the advice route seems way more appealing unless mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, unless I'm emailing people already on my email list that they have specifically double opted into my specific list. I've never had sure, a list sure. where I've scraped people before. So that's quite an interesting, because of course the way that you interact with those is a little different. Um, so yeah, so I guess. Right way, there is it, some people who don't have anything at the moment though, to go mm. to LinkedIn or to go, you know, just Google people, you'll find things. If you don't have a start already, it's, it can be your start. Mm. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. Go ahead, Kat. I was going to say, obviously keeping your list segregated is really important and literally every aspect of social media and website and everything literally should just be funneling into your email list. Like it's literally mm -hmm. just meant to be pushing traffic in as much as possible, or at least that's what I think. I am biased because I like email, but I don't know. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, if you're able to build an email list through a website, through whatever it means you are, that building an email list is one of the most, it's an asset. That's, that's, that's money right there. Every lead you get, every person that opts into your email list, that that's, we have to look at that. That's potential sales. That's money that is sitting there that could be ours. And 
Um, cold email is a little different. Again, what we do is we're, we're, we typically work B2B with companies and we're scraping, we're finding contact information, we're doing all that stuff, which can be a little bit more sophisticated. But if you just have an email list, just knowing how to reach out to them periodically, once a month, once a week, whatever that is with value that drives them to want to take another action that's relevant to you, whether that's buying, whether that's signing up for something else, joining a community, whatever that might be. But if you're someone that sells B2B there or wants to sell your art B2B, let's just figure out who would be the ideal buyer in terms of what their role would be in a company and what types of companies would be a right fit for them. Because then you can find an email list. Now, if you're B2C, what are some routes you could take there? Some routes might be doing outreach to try to get on podcasts. What are art-related podcasts that you can get on to share more about your story and give an opportunity for people to learn more about you and purchase art from you? So no matter you know what your focus is, there's always a route to just get yourself out there and get in front of more potential buyers. I love that. Um, put yourself out there, isn't it? Yeah, opportunity <laughs> dances with those on the dance floor, as they say. Um, <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about subject lines and titles, because for me, I think that's one of the biggest, that and obviously the first line where people look at that and decide, am I going to click this or am I just not going to ignore it entirely? Um, what, what, do you, what do you find works best for you? Or is it just a situational thing? Yeah, it's situational, but again, direct, short and sweet and to the point. You know, if I do outreach for my own business, it's reaching out to people and I say, you know, basically uh, requesting phone call, more sales appointments, like something simple like that. Um, so I always like direct, short, sweet and to the point. And again, making sure if you are doing this on your own, that you do a spam checker to make sure that it's not going to, it's not a spammy title that's going to put you in, again, spam jail. Loads of exclamation but, marks, red wordy exactly. things. Yeah, like. buy now, <laughs> exactly. Anything like that, you don't, you'll go right into promotions and they won't see you. So test it out, but be direct and to the point with whatever your message is, your subject line should be sharing just that. Oh, that's really I interesting because like I didn't know that. I didn't know the spammy headlines that will get you straight into, into trouble. The spam gel. Oh, yeah. Spam know. gel, exactly. That's that's Kat's favorite thing, a spam gel. <laughs> uh, Got to keep you out of spam gel. But also, even in the in the base of the email, if you put hyperlinks in there, you put images in there, like those are other things that are going to put you into spam gel too. So we want to make mm. sure, like when we send emails, typically it's just plain text. Just oh, really? simple, plain text. Yeah, no images, no videos, no hyperlinks. Like we keep things very simple because we always just want to make sure that we can monitor the spam and we're hoping that our words can be compelling enough where they, uh, you know, they're interested without needing to see a big video or a picture or a PDF or something like that. Oh, it's always a so, challenge with an artist, isn't yeah, I was it? Yeah, going to say, because we put links in and have pictures in. Mm. But you're not doing cold emails and often no, they're not cold. you're, you're I, actually directing mm, someone yeah, to a often. store. But if the outcome was to get someone to reply, that's obviously different. Do you? When you get replies, do you manually reply to everyone or do you have some sort of automation? Yeah, great question. And, and first, that's another thing too that's important to say is what's your goal of the, the email? Is the goal to just get someone to click on that link or is the goal for a phone call? You know, for us, when we set up these meetings, that the whole goal is to get 15 minutes on the calendar. The reason we don't like to put website links, even if it doesn't put you in spam, because it doesn't always, there's times, you know, it's not like putting a hyperlink and you're definitely going to go in jail mm -hmm. or spam jail, I should say, is, um, you know, the, the, for us, it's like, we don't even really want them to go on the website because mm -hmm. really it's like, just get on a phone call. Like the website that can take in a whole rabbit hole. You forget to even respond and you're gone. So we always yeah, like to keep true. things simple. Um, so that that's part two, why we don't like to put other stuff. Cause again, details create confusion. Confused buyer is never a buyer. Um, so that, that goes back into that and cat your question. Now I'm forgetting it. Um, say that one more time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I remember it either? It uh, was about respond. <laughs> do, you, do you respond personally? Oh, right. Yes, oh yeah. Yes. Automation responding. <laughs> ah, Chris, that's good. See, <laughs> that's, why, yeah, that's why we need three of us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good work. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so for us, you know, we've in the beginning, when we first started building the company, yes, it was, we, we had to eat our own dog food and it was, um, you know, manually responding, but now we have a really good team. We have great templates in place. Now yeah. that we've seen so many responses, we know what the typical responses are and we have templates that they're able to use. And sometimes you need to make adjustments to it. So, you know, some people say, oh, it, can it just be all automated, all technology? 
No, it's humans mm-hmm. powered by technology. The technology and the templates and the systems help. Um, but we have a good team that knows also understands nuance because, you know, if you, if we're pretending to be a great story seat, about nuance, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. If we're, uh, I did, you know, if we're, I some, someone emailed in and said, um, your art is amazing. I'd like to be friends and a little more. And of course, my assistant at the time was, who, who's suddenly no, long, no longer working for me, but, um, and it wasn't over this. <laughs> she replied and goes like, oh, that's amazing. And I was like, you do understand the nuance of that is he was asking for sex. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, that's you funny. can't just say yes. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't just jump that's to the it. yes right away. Right. That's so imagine a robot doing that. You're like, why is my calendar so booked out? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And why are they all in-person meetings too? I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know what? Having a, having a, like we have it with us, just even with our social media. In fact, actually, even if it was just yourself doing it, and this is for anyone, like even if it's just mm-hmm. responding to your DMs, right. you know, have a spreadsheet where you have the input. This is, this is what they write and this is the response. And you can literally like control F to find the relevant word and wherever it appears and then have those, those canned responses. Obviously you can customize and change as you said, but it will, it just, it means that you can, I mean, it just takes, it does take a lot of time otherwise. So this way you can keep some level of consistency as well. And I think that's really helpful. You don't have to think about things. It's just- Exactly. You know, for 80% of the meetings that, you know, people book with our clients, all it is, is template one, boom, sent. That's it. It's already done. And then that's, that's it. Then they forward that chain to our clients and they use template, you know, seven or whatever number it is. And they just fill in a couple of blanks for our, like, it, it just, to your point, Chris, it like makes us sort of have to think. And as mm-hmm. entrepreneurs, as business people, which everyone, you know, whether you're an artist, you know, you're a business person, like we have so many things dragging us, whether, you know, pulling at us, whether that's our business, our personal life, everything. How can we minimize the amount of things that we have to think about? And even if we're like, oh, the response only takes me 15 seconds. Well, that's 15 seconds every time adds up. And what if you have a spelling error? What if you misspell? What if you put something in the wrong place? What if you, you know, don't hit send or whatever that is? Like, how do we minimize these variables to make it easy on us? Mm. And I mean, I think also it's just not the physical time, but the mental fatigue of doing it over and over and over again. But also like everyone, you're all juggling a million plates in business, in art, whatever it is. I mean, you've got all this other stuff to deal with and gen just life in general. So I like that. Yeah. Okay. What was the other question? I think I have another question I was going to come with, but yeah, automation. And I think, I think there's, um, I mean, we do all our responses manually, but we just use a template too. And I think that that is the best for sure. Huh. I wish I could remember things. Same. My memory is like, I get so <laughs> into conversations. Like that we should, it. that we've missed, that you really, you want to add before we leave? Um, we interrogated the hell out of you. We've got all the information. <laughs> I think you guys have had great questions. I, I love it. You guys, you guys are, are, are awesome. I've, I've really enjoyed this. So yeah, I feel like we've done a good job of like getting into a lot of the specifics of email and yeah, yeah for me, I just, I, I've always tried to make things relevant and hopefully for, for artists, I've been able to make it relevant. But I, I think if I have, it's because you both have asked great questions that have, have helped get there. Yeah. I yeah. Definitely- actually, I have another question. Of course you have. Yeah. <laughs> so keep rolling. Let's hear it. Um, but this isn't necessarily for cold emails, um, but for asking for referrals. Now, one of the interesting things about the luxury mm-hmm. art market, and in fact, actually, I suppose you could even do this as a, a cold email, you know, in the same way that you're asking for advice, you could be asking, like, do you know if anyone, um, you know, like, d- does anyone that you know is interested in this kind of art mm-hmm. and just, you know, whatever, however you want to word it, but um, is that using email as refer- like to create referrals for business. Is that something that you do often? And like, what are your tips for that? I wouldn't say I do it often, but absolutely. Yeah. It's it, again, any of these tools, email is a great toolkit to get us in front of people and to get someone's attention. And, and whether it's a billboard, whether it's an Instagram ad, whether it's email, it just, how do we get attention and email can be a great way to do things like what you just mentioned there. And how do we leverage email to get things that we're, we, we want and, referrals is a great thing. Hey, who's three people that you would recommend that you think could benefit from my services? I need to keep it in a short, sweet way. Hmm. 
Um, more questions. What do you think about the use of humor in emails? It's a great question. Um, it's tough because, you know, think people can misread things through emails, <laughs> just through, through text. And it, you know, there could be humor, like maybe adding gifts. If it's on brand, I don't see anything wrong with that. It really depends right. on what your brand is. Number one, so that, that's most important. But having a humorous email can be very difficult, especially at least from a cold email outreach standpoint. So that, that is a challenge. So if you can pull it off, that's amazing. The one probably time I've really tried to pull it off, it was a disaster and a nightmare. So I, um, <laughs> what's the story, Adam? <laughs> that was, we were, we were, uh, we were launching what was our, our first version of our technology for our college recruiting firm. So we would always get college student organizations, business clubs, engineering clubs, actually a lot of art clubs signed up too, because they would make money on our platform and can get jobs for their, their, their members. And my job was to get student clubs to sign up. So we were sending out, a, I was sending out a mass email from my email. And this was probably, I don't know, 2016, 2017. And the, one of the schools on the list was BYU, which anyone who's not familiar with Brigham Young University in Utah in the United States, it's a, a Mormon, very religious university. Wow. And in the subject line, I put uh, sign the F asterisk, asterisk, asterisk up, all exclamation, exclamation point, all caps as a way to get their attention. And then in the first line of the email, I said, you know, kidding, kidding, like, please, prof uh, you know, excuse my profanity. And then I went into my like normal type of email mm -hmm. and some of the students liked it, but then I never got so many emails in my life of people telling me how, uh, you know, how inappropriate it was bad for the brand, blah, 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 blah. So it was bad. I wrote a nice apology email that next day. It ended up, I think, you know, curing that bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, but I tried it there and it didn't work so well. So I, I try to stay away from it. Or it worked really well because you got loads of responses. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely did. I'm not going to deal I with it. I definitely got now. a lot of responses. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That was funny. <laughs> but yeah, of course, I think like context is important when you're sending these kind of things for of course. sure. I uh, probably should have also... left BYU off the list. <laughs> right. Also, brand. I know that this is a sprawling message, but also, and I think that's all part about knowing yourself and being authentic mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, if you are like, I am a little slightly humorous person, not that you would have noticed by this point at all, <laughs> but um, doing it, one of my things when I send emails is that we, I always include a crap joke at the bottom. Um, and, but that's more like on a newsletter type thing because people are too busy. They will always scroll down to see the crap joke. And I get people that are upset with me if I don't send them now. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> it's part of the brand. It's, it's who yeah. you are. So yeah, absolutely. If it's on brand, do it. It's just tougher from a cold email standpoint because they don't right. know your brand. That's the challenge with cold email. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, anything else you want to ask Chris? I, I think we've covered all That's sorts amazing. it's been amazing adam really really enjoyed it thanks so much um, adam final thoughts or top three tips if someone was to come away from this with just three pieces of information what would that be for you so number one is be yourself always just be yourself um number two is simplicity and then number three is um you're being selfish if you don't do everything you can to sell your art uh, for as much money as you can, because that's how you're going to be able to grow what you're doing an amazing job of. And that's how you can impact more people and give people the joy and the love and the great energy that your art provides. So don't be selfish because I know you're, you're not a selfish person. Thanks. I love that, Adam. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. As always, all our social links are in the description. Make sure you uh, give us a follow so you can catch future episodes now you can also catch adam on instagram it's adam i rosen uh, and also you can see his website which is eocworks.com uh, we will put all the information in the description as well next episode we're going to be answering your questions anyway from all three of us see you later thanks Kat and chris thanks adam <laughs> see you Kat. <laughs>